As a program that likes to trade in empirically provable facts and rational debate, we've noticed what some others have also noticed, and that actually finally made headlines recently. Canada's got a data problem. What does that mean and why should you care? Well, with us to explain. In the nation's capital, Wayne Smith, former chief statistician for Canada. And here in our studio, Craig Alexander, chief economist with Deloitte Canada. Jan Kessel, president and CEO of Enveronics Analytics. Sunil Johal, policy director at the Mowat Center, which is now associated with the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at U of T. And Tavia Grant, reporter at the Globe and Mail. And we are delighted to welcome everybody to our program today. Wayne Smith, to you in Ottawa as well. And can I say, especially to Tavia, your first time on television. First time. Please Excellent. be gentle. I, we're <laughs> very happy that you're having it here with us today. Uh, this program came about as a result of numerous conversations we have had over the years, and we have had reactions like this. Mr. Director, if you would. The innovation sector is a $7 trillion a year sector in America, and they want to make it $14 trillion, and they're going to play tough to make themselves rich. If there's a $7 trillion, what's ours? Well, I don't know the exact number because we really don't have a, an organized uh, focus uh, for pulling this together. Does the Ontario government collect race-based data when it comes to perinatal health care? No. No, they don't. No. Should we have these statistics handy so that we can make intelligent policy decisions on this? One of the challenges of doing policy analysis is that, that we don't have all the data that you would want. I know that guy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, we hear this all the time. We don't have the data. We're not sure that the data we have is any good, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, Wayne, start us off, please. Is the data that Canada collects of good quality in your view? Well, obviously you can produce statistics on an infinite variety of things. So the challenge for statistical offices is to produce information that's relevant to the most salient policy needs at any given time based on the resources available. I think in Canada, we have, we have, we have on the economic and business side of the equ equation, a very robust system, probably one of the, also certainly one of the best in the world, highly integrated. Uh, there are some issues about access to the data, but the, the data there is, is, is of very good quality. On the social side, because our, our, our statistical program is largely survey-based, there's been a steady deterioration in uh, the quality of information because of our di increasing difficulty in communicating with Canadians. Uh, so countries that have statistical systems that are based initially and primarily on administrative data generally have better quality data than those who are working exclusively with surveys, which is largely our case. So there are some quality issues. Uh, there has also been a very significant reduction in the budget to st of Statistics Canada over the last few years. About $30 million has been taken out of the budget of annually, is, is missing now from the budget. Does that affect the quality of the data that they collect? Uh, we, this is Canada very, very sp explicitly decided that it would not compromise quality in order to maintain a, a very broad program. What's the use of having data if you can't rely on it? So the, the, the cut was taken by actually reducing the scope of the program, not the quality of the, of the data that was continuing. In which case, let me go to Jan for the follow-up. Do we collect enough data in this country? I think we don't collect enough. There are many gaps, and data are very important in terms of how the country works and for how you know, citizens and members of communities have services. Police, fire, health care all depend on good data, and there are gaps. But the data that we collect are of good quality, and Statistics Canada is regarded as a, an independent statistical agency that provides data that's world quality. We just have some areas where we need more data. I think you've said on this program a few times, I'd love to answer that question, but I don't have the data for that. Well, almost every time I do research on, on policy issues, you run into data limitations. Um, and I think a couple of comments that, that Wayne said really resonated around, you know, the statistical agency is trying to measure, you know, what's salient, like what's important. But the challenge is what's important constantly changes. Right? Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that's happening is as the economy evolves, as society evolves, I think the statistical agency is having difficulty keeping pace with the changing times. And are they measuring the things that matter the most? And then there's the resourcing issue, and it's, it's directly tied. If you don't have additional resources, how can you keep pace with the, the changes of what you need to measure? Tell me one thing that's missing that you would like to see us have more data on. Wow, I don't even know where to start. There's so many. Um, <laughs> you know, a, a, good, a, a really good example is um, Statistics Canada uh, stopped the survey of labor and income dynamics, and, and ultimately it was replaced by an, uh, another survey, an income survey. 
But in the transition, we lost a lot of information about occupations. And I think one of the challenges we have today in terms of skill shortages, I mean, workers would like to know where are the shortages? Where, where, what are the jobs that are currently uh, businesses are in need of? And what skills do I need to fill those occupations? Um, but we don't actually have the detailed granular data that, that workers need. So on the labor market information side of things, the, the government just recently announced new, new money for training programs. But if you really wanted to make it impactful, what you need is, is information on, okay, so what, what skills should I be building and which programs are going to have the most effect in terms of boosting my skills? And those, those are questions we don't have answers to. Can you follow up on that in, insofar as why it's so important that we have, and maybe the question I should have asked already is, data or data? Because I'm hearing both. I keep flipping <laughs> between the two. It is, okay, yeah. so there's no right or wrong necessarily. There's no right or wrong. You say tomato, I say tomato. Okay, why so important to have good data why or data? Why so important? Well, I can speak from a journalistic point of view. You run into problems as an, an economist where you try to research something and you hit a wall and then you can't show what the trends are. As a journalist, we want to tell pe people's stories. And so there are so many times in the newsroom when we start, we set out to do something, we might see an amazing investigation or story in the US and we think we would like to know what's going on here and we hit a wall. We can't tell our stories just based on anecdotes, we need some kind of backbone and that's the data. Um, so some of, I would say, some of our big projects in the last few years have arisen out of data gaps. So one was um, a simple question I had, which was what's the most dangerous job in Canada? That should be hmm. easy to answer. How would you measure that? Well, six months later and thousands of dollars that the globe spent, um, we know that one of the highest risk jobs for fatalities is fishing. So this fishing? Yes, the fishing mm -hmm. industry. Huh. Um, so we had to go through many, many hoops. In Australia, in the US, in the UK, they produce worker fatality rates. In, in Canada, they do not. And they still don't? They still don't, huh. no. Um, the other big project was the Unfounded series. That was essentially filling a data gap. Uh, Robin Doolittle, my colleague, uh, had this amazing idea of canvassing 873 police forces across Canada mm. to find out what the rates of unfounded, um, unfounded rates for sexual assault cases. And she found out that it was one in five that were dismissed as base baseless. So, so it affects our journalism, which in turn affects the public's understanding of certain issues. Um, it affects our ability to understand each other and just having a common ground for which we can then have lots of arguments. But let's start with a common base. Mm. Sunil, from your perch at a think tank, the lack of data or data on stuff you need to or want to know, how does it have an impact on you? Uh, very simple. I mean, our government spend hundreds of billions of dollars a year on various programs across a whole range of areas. If they don't have data, uh, with which to measure where the needs are greatest, where we have issues, how can we effectively spend that money? How can we provide value to taxpayers? Uh, and this runs the gamut across almost every area that government is involved in. I mean, Craig mentioned skills training. If we think about education, uh, are, are, is the 20 plus billion dollars the Ontario government spends in the education sector being spent effectively? Uh, if we don't have data to measure that, we don't know when a program maybe should be terminated and we should move to a different area of focus. Uh, we don't know when something is working well and maybe we should scale that up across the country or more broadly. Uh, so, I mean, this is a very fundamental question, not just for governments. I mean, we also have pri the private sector relies on the data that Statistics Canada and other entities generate, individuals, advocacy organizations. Uh, I mean, data has been called the new lifeblood or oil of the economy. Uh, so, I mean, if Canada wants to be a uh, success in the 21st century, we need to uh, be a data powerhouse. And we see private sector firms like Facebook and Amazon um, are so successful because they collect vast amounts of data and they know what to do with it. So uh, the governments that are going to be successful and the societies that are going to be successful going forward are those that are going to be gener are able to generate the relevant kinds of data that they need and action it. Wayne Smith, I wonder if I could follow up with you in this regard. Mm -hmm. is, is part of the reason we don't have adequate data that it's too hard to get? In other words, how accessible is that information to people who want it? Well, I think, I mean, the, the information is, generally speaking, the information that's being discussed is information that Statistics Canada doesn't have as opposed to data that we have and people can't access. Uh, they, we, the, generally speaking, all of the information from Statistics Canada is in the public domain. There's nothing that's, that's, that's held back. There's nothing that can be held back. Uh, we, we make data available for free on the 
on, on the website. Uh, we provide uh, data files to, to, to schools, colleges, and other people who want to use them. The, those ones are confidentialized because we can't, we are, we're required by the Statistics Act to protect confidentiality respondents. We've also worked with universities and colleges to ensure that even the actual detailed confidential data can be accessed in universities across Canada. Uh, there's more, that, uh, on the, that's on the social side. On the business side, we have a serious problem in Canada that the restrictions for confidentiality under the Statistics Act make it very difficult to publish detailed economic data, and that's a, that's a serious concern. Why is that a problem? Uh, well, you think about it, uh, you know, basically in some cases we can't publish data by industry for a province because there are only two or three businesses in that province of that type. So therefore, if you want to do an analysis uh, of, of, by industry you're, you're, you're in smaller provinces, you're seriously ha uh, hampered. And issues, issues like the environment are inherently local. I mean, you're, you're, so if you can't obtain information about the scale and the activities of businesses in, in, in a city. You can't really link or, or make the connections as well as you ought to be able to between economic activity and the environment and, 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 and climate change. So I, it's not, I think the issue is more the, the data you know, either doesn't exist or it's in the hands of people who choose not to make it public. Hmm. And, uh, that's, a, that's an issue, another issue entirely. Okay, Jan, let me follow up with you. Let's say the data exists and Stats Canada has it. You deal in this every day. How accessible is that information to people but who don't work there? So the data that Stats Canada produces have become more and more accessible. We, um, we access data from the census. We can access microfiles. We can go in the research data center and use those data. So I think that Stats Canada has made progress. There's probably you know way to go, but they've made progress mm -hmm. in making those data available. But I want to go back to something that Wayne said, which is a little bit different, which is there are data that could be more usable and more available if we looked at the different methods of creating data. There are a lot of administrative data sources that can be turned into official statistics that can inform policy and help make communities run better and work better. And there's a modernization project going on at Stats Canada right now to do experimentation with how we can use data that are collected for administrative purposes but can be turned into official statistics. There's a new program around housing statistics. There's a crowdsourcing experiment around cannabis prices, for example. Mm. And so I think that what we need the government to do is to support Statistics Canada and other agencies to use new methods, which are being used in other countries and are also being used in the private sector, like Facebook, although I'm not sure I agree that they're actually doing the best job. Mm. But we need official statistics to make administrative data and big data accurate and usable. What will it take and, to make that happen? Well, one thing that's really important is that we really preserve things like the census, because the census is the, the benchmark against which administrative records around health care or, or uh, security or social services can be used and put in now, context if, and made actionable. But if memory serves, the first thing the Trudeau government did when it came in was restore the long-form census, Correct. did they not? Yes, okay. and so, but that's, it's important that Canadians recognize that it's one symbol but we do need data to make good decisions and make people's lives yeah. better. The other thing is Canada, um, you know, is a federalist organization. The provinces have data. The, the government has data. The federal government has data. Data need to be shared between departments. Okay. and need ask. to be shared across the different jurisdictions. And we need a strategy for doing that. We can't just let it sort of happen willy-nilly. Okay. It's too hard. Well, let me ask Tavia about that, because presumably in your job, you try to get information out of the federal government, out of the provincial government, yes. agencies, boards, commissions, whatever. Yes. How accessible is that information to you as a reporter probing for it? I think r reporters are routinely banging their heads against the wall. <laughs> because? <laughs> um, it, it can be long. There are some sometimes when we just have to give up on certain projects. So sometimes you just get to the end of the road and it's we just can't access it. Because they um, won't give it to you? Yes. Yeah. There's sometimes when we can't... Um, access, we, we, I mean, the, you could do a whole other show about uh, freedom of information requests and things like that, but court records, there are so many areas that we, um, we try to go down a certain road and we just can't. Can you um, give me an example of that? Let me think of, uh, well, I'll think of one data gap that I ran into because it was just last week. I was trying to do a book review 
Um, I was writing about asbestos and the impacts of health. I wanted to know about the burden of disease. I went to StatsCan's website. This isn't their fault, but Quebec does not opt into the reporting of the cancer That's rates. Right. right. So therefore, I can't get a national picture, and I don't really know the severity, which means that researchers will have a much harder time predicting in the future what these burdens are going to look like. Because asbestos is so, Quebec, after all. It's Quebec-based. Yes, and we yes. know that the, hmm. there's many more cases in Quebec than anywhere else. Hmm. So um, we run into these things all the time. Um, it's not just a, uh, a journalist issue. It's really a public issue. So there's certainly parents and there's, there's ordinary people all the time who also have these, these struggles. I was going to say, can you make a bit of a list for us here, Craig, about who, who needs access to information and routinely has a hard time getting it? How about everybody? <laughs> um, <clears throat> no, seriously. I mean, if you're if uh, if uh, Deloitte was doing a piece of work with a with a government looking at how we could harness AI and machine learning to basically uh, increase the efficiency of of government, and we had a great brainstorming session about what was what was possible, but almost immediately we ran into an issue that the departments internal to the provincial government couldn't share the data between themselves mm -hmm. to actually unlock the use. So, I mean, one of the challenges that we have, or one of the ironies we have is the computational power, our ability to use data to identify trends and develop analysis has gone up enormously. Hmm. And the data isn't available to actually unlock the potential, right? So we could, we could do so much in terms of improving the efficiency of government programs or increasing the impact they're having or make them more cost efficient. Uh, businesses desperately need data in terms of running, running their business and making um, strategic plans. I, I remember when the long form census was cut, you know, I had, I had a politician ask me, you know, well, the, you know, your firm doesn't use the census, does it? And it's like, well, of course we do. We use it to uh, identify where we're going to locate offices and what markets need support. And so businesses need information. And, and if you look at, look at businesses today, they measure everything, right? And because they know what measured gets done. They, they measure for efficiency. And, and at the end of the day, if you, can't, if, you don't, if you don't have access to the data, you're not going to get the best outcomes. And the same is true for policy and government. If you don't, if you don't have the data, you're basically judging your policies on what you think is going to happen. And one of the things we know from economics is, man, there's a lot of unintended consequences when you do mm -hmm. something. So you really want robust analytical work done on your policies. Now, the Moat Center, of course, was designed in the first place. It was created by the previous Liberal government to do a lot of that deep diving into difficult analytical issues and come up with policy prescriptions and do the studies and all that heavy lifting. Have you found, have you found yourself trying to get studies done on various issues so that you can present evidence to government and stakeholders, but you couldn't get there because you couldn't get the data? It happens all the time. So, I mean, one of our big areas of focus is intergovernmental relations. So is Ontario getting a fair deal from the federal government in terms of expenditure? So the provincial economic accounts, which are generated by Statistics Canada, uh, I believe the last time they were updated uh, was it 2011 or 12, and then they were just recently updated again a year or two ago. So there, there was about a six year gap there, six or seven year gap where we didn't know how much money the federal government was spending or collecting in each province across the country. It makes it really hard to analyze uh, are, are certain provinces perhaps being treated unfairly? Are they not getting their fair share of uh, federal spending? How can that uh, basic information not be available? That's shocking. I'm not sure, and we would, I mean, we kind of continually would check in with StatsCan, and they would say, don't worry, it's coming soon. And I mean, I think, the, I think it was 2017, we finally saw the, the new release of the data, and that was great, because we, we had been writing reports for three or four years now based on five-year-old uh, data, and it comes up on a whole range of different reports. I mean, a very simple example right now is there's been a lot of talk about the gig economy, people working for Uber. Uh, we had no idea how many people were actually doing that. To StatsCan's credit, they uh, produced a survey about two years ago which showed that actually very few people are working in the gig economy hmm. in Canada. That punctured the balloon a little bit of all the hype around, well, everybody's doing this, this is the wave of the future. But uh, I mean, the challenge is we have uh, a budget. Um, 
restriction at stats can. They can't do everything for mm -hmm. everybody, and priorities continually change. So the innovation economy is big now, the digital economy, they're starting to move into that mm -hmm. space. But what will be left behind? And those are going to be important issues to some people. So, I mean, we, we have to start thinking more creatively about how we can use administrative data, partner with the private sector, look for other sources of information that can feed uh, the beast, essentially, because you've got so many stakeholders mm -hmm. who want that information but maybe can't get it, or at a minimum can't get it as frequently as they want. Right. It's updated very uh, irregularly. Let's do a little comparing and contrasting with Wayne Smith uh, in Ottawa. In terms of the information that a Canadian can get from his or her governments, federal or provincial, how mm -hmm. does that compare to what, say, an American citizen can get from his or her national or state governments? Well, the, the United States statistical system is, is an interesting creature. It, it's, it's huge. Uh, it's very decentralized. There's a, a, a vast amount of statistical activity going on in the United States, uh, some of it through, directly through government departments, the U.S. Bureau of the Census, for example, other pieces through major university-based uh, research organizations. Uh, the, 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 their, their, their efficiency is terrible, but the scope is huge. Uh, so by, by, by comparison, I, I, I could run this U.S. Census and run ours on the savings. I could. <laughs> that's just, just a guess, but I'm, I'm thinking I could. Uh, so the, the, we have that's we suffer by the comparison because the, the U.S. system is is data rich. There are just so many organizations out there producing the stuff that uh, it's, it's very rich. It's probably it, it, it doesn't. There's no other country comparable in the world that's uh, just is, 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 is with the scope of data that's available from various sources. It's finding it, I guess, and getting and using it is is the challenge. So just to confirm, they do they do more and have more publicly available. Is that right? Uh, they're very, they're, they're very restricted. They don't allow the data. They really prevent the depart government departments from trying to monopolize the data or from uh, you know, charging for it. They, they really run a very open and very free system in the United huh. States. Chan, do you, you, you obviously you try to get information from StatsCan and other sources here in Canada. Do you also try to get info out of the U.S.? Yes, almost a half of our business is in the U.S. with okay. U.S. customers. Compare and contrast, um, if you would. Well, it's different. I mean, the U.S. data have been always made freely available. Um, and Canada has moved more to that approach more recently. But um, on both sides of the border, we collaborate both with governments and other private sector organizations. Like last year, our organization provided data and analytics to drive businesses to 2,000 companies in Canada and the U.S. And we took those data from 83 sources, and we integrated them and we added value to them so that businesses could get at them quickly. And I think part of the solution is more strategic collaboration between different levels of government and the private sector and more public awareness about how the decisions get made. So we can get data in different ways on both sides of the border. But in Canada, we need to be sure that there's an agenda process to understand what the money will be spent on. Everyone's talking about the fact that there's budget cuts and there's limited resources. But it's the government that decides what will be collected. Stats Canada's mandate is to use best practices, collect, release, make the data available. But the minister responsible, i.e. the government, mm -hmm. gets to decide what are the priorities. Should and that change? I think that we need a process for the organizations, the yes. press, the, the, uh, the think tanks, the you know, various private sector firms, Stats Canada, the agencies, to really set the data agenda. There's a, there's a consultation going on right now in the federal, that the federal government's leading around a Canadian data strategy. But I get concerned that it's more about the technology, it's more about the privacy mm. and the encryption and the anonymization, which are important. But what about, the, what about the content? What do we need to ensure that we have good data on which to base mm. public policy? We need uh, an initiative and a leadership, and I would still count on Statistics Canada to be a part of that. But this is a political decision, not a statistical decision. Wayne, I'm inferring from your from from the the, the nodding I'm seeing that you agree that this these decisions ought to well, be beyond politics. I I, I, I agree. I mean, this, our system suffers tremendously from what's the issue of the day. Uh, a lot of the, the funding has been coming to Statistics Canada over the last few years since the, the, the end of the 1990s. Actually, has been has generally been tied to this is the current policy issue. And so we're going to we're going to have we're going to have cannabis statistics, and we're going to look at uh, foreign ownership of residential property, and and money is given to Statistics Canada for that. But the kind of the kind of data 
you know, that's, that's applied research. It's the kind of data for generalized scientific research where you can actually discover new issues that haven't been identified yet and dive down on the issues that have to better understand them is what's not being produced. It's what was cut out of the budget in the, in, in the, for, in the, in the 2000s. And it's what it needs to be restored and it needs to be protected so that over time we actually have a solid base of, 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 of statistical information that's, that's easily and readily available and that can explore, genuinely explore in depth the issues that we're facing in Canada. Hmm. Okay, in our, um, we've got less than 10 minutes to go here and I want to put this issue on the table for some considerable discussion. And that is, there may have been a time, both in this province and maybe nationally, when politicians wanted good, accurate information upon which to base their decisions. I don't know if we live in that world anymore. We may live in a world now where things are so ideological, politicians aren't that interested in getting empirically provable facts to make their decisions. They just want to do what they want to do for the reasons they want to do them. Tavia, what do we do about that? Well, First of all, that can blow up in your face <laughs> um, when we base decisions on either faulty data or no data. And the example I'm thinking of that you would probably remember is when we were um, determining that there was a massive labor shortage in Canada, um, which was at odds with uh, federal uh, Statistics Canada data. Um, mm -hmm. It turned out that the source that the then federal government was using was Kijiji. Kijiji. Those ads were not a reliable source. <laughs> the whole premise of a labor shortage was faulty, but it was the justification to bring in many, many temporary foreign workers. So there's very real world implications when you base things on unreliable data or none at all. Um, and then the other thing I would say is fiscal considerations. So if you are worried about your budget and you wanna spend money as wisely as possible, um, you wanna target programs and you wanna measure the impact of programs. And so I think this, will help people make smarter decisions that in turn are better, uh, better for the economy and better for our, our, um, our budget. <laughs> Do you see, Sunil, uh, less interest by politicians in the reports that you produce because they, they already know what they want to do and don't, in, don't bother me with the facts as it were? They're always interested in our reports. I mean, I can't speak for other <laughs> yeah. I, 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 mean, I, th I mean, I think one of the challenges in inside governments is there's very little money spent on program evaluation. I mean, depends on the numbers you look at, but you're talking about 0.1, 0.2% of overall program expenditures actually measure the effectiveness of programs. Should be higher? Should be much higher. I mean, if we're in a world now in Ontario where the government wants to get out of deficit and we're talking $10, $12 billion in savings identified over the next three or four years, how are you going to decide which programs aren't working and we should terminate? And how are you going to decide which programs are working uh, well? And the only answer to that is understanding program evaluation and having accurate measurement of this program is great, this program is not so great. But the problem is, there are a lot of disincentives to effective evaluation inside governments because no government wants to put their hand up and say, guess what, that multi-billion dollar program we announced three years ago had no effects. Mm. Uh, that's embarrassing, it's, it's a political uh, loser. Bureaucrats also don't want to be uh, identified as having worked on programs that don't work. So how mm. do we kind of push pa past those uh, disincentives to evaluate programs, be honest with ourselves about what's working and what's not? And I mean, I think that's a huge challenge for governments in Canada going forward, understanding that issue of uh, what works and what doesn't more effectively. Craig, admittedly, I may be asking for informed speculation here as opposed to whether you actually have the hard data to rely on. But if you had to guess, what percentage of government programs that come forward come forward after a deep, thorough analytical dive into the numbers and crunching the data, <clears throat> excuse me, as opposed to this is what our party's base wants and therefore we're going to do it? You're not, you, you can't judge, right? You don't, you don't know how much is, you know, rigorous, what, what policies have been rigorously evaluated and then which ones, which ones haven't. Um, but I am concerned about the, the trend, not just in Canada, but globally, around the rise in, in populism and increasing distrust of, of, of sort of elites that are talking about you know, evidence-based policies. I think that in the wake of 08, 09, the, the deep recession and the financial crisis, I think there's been a loss of confidence in, in public policy think tanks, in recommendations that are coming. And so I think that there's a sense that 
evidence-based policy isn't as important today. And, and, and so this isn't just about government, right? So there is the issue, I think it's a very legitimate issue, that, that if, you, if you measure something and track something, it increases transparency and accountability, and that's something we want, but there could be a political disincentive to have that. Um, because it can have political consequences if the program you announced don't, doesn't have the desired impact. But at the same time, it isn't clear to me that the, the public actually is demanding evidence-based mm. policy making. Hmm. And that, that increasingly there's, there's a, a sense of distrust around you know, what, what, what analysts and, and policy wonks have been saying for, for years. Because the, the, the outcomes people have been getting haven't matched what they they were promised. And so I think it's undermined the, the confidence and, and support. And so I think that this is a very fundamental issue. Wayne Smith, how many times when you were the chief statistician for Canada, would you have had an argument with a civil servant or say a, a minister's political staffer who wanted to do one thing and you, had, you actually had the hard crunch data suggesting, you know, if you do that, that's not going to work. Here's the direction you maybe ought to rethink. Well, I'm, I'm not really at the table for the discussions. Those, those discuss I can tell you that, for example, uh, for the decision regarding the 2011 census, I remember a conversation with a senior uh, conservative minister at the time where he said he agreed with me that it was lousy policy to, make a, to go to a voluntary census, but it was great politics, and it was clear on which side of the line he, he felt he, he, he wanted to be. Uh, so the, and there are often, I mean, there's... there's what we do is we supply the data to the to the policy analysts in the policy department, uh, uh, and at the end of the day, we don't get to hear the advice. So we don't know where if things have, if, if, or things appear to be inconsistent with the data in our eyes. We don't know where it went off the rails, whether it went off the rails at the level of policy analysis in the department, whether it went off the rails in the in communicating the issues to the minister, whether the minister simply overrode. You know the recommendations of the uh, of, of the bureaucrats. I do know that this government, in particular, also set out very initially to say that for every every one of our initiatives, we want to have indicators that we will track, and uh, so that we can tell whether we're accomplishing it. And we want to make them public. I mean, that was that was an intention at one point of this of the current government. It doesn't seem to have happened. Uh, but certainly the, the idea was meritorious, uh, you know, actually having it something, somebody mm -hmm. declaring up front, you know, how are we going to determine whether this policy works, collecting the data necessary to make the, to, to, to evaluate it and then making that public would be a very good start on a, in a better system. Hmm. Jen, a apropos of what uh, Craig was just saying, you know, at the end of the day, it's the politicians who get elected and at the end of the day, they have to be accountable for their decisions. If they want to disregard data, and if they want to go with either their gut or what they think their base wants or whatever, aren't they entitled to do that? Well, I don't know about entitled. I, I, I would entitled question, what, would question what's good for the country. Hmm. You know, take a specific example like health care as the population ages mm -hmm. and people are living alone. And we need to plan for long-term care and we need to plan for people aging in place. And we need to know how money gets spent between hospitals and social services. How can politicians not want to have a data-driven approach to the next 20 years of what's going to happen in Canada. Because it might help ask, their re-election choice I would, chances mm. I would if ask they follow Canadians what their base wants. to yeah. make their choices based mm. on who is going to support evidence-driven decision-making. Yes, it's the buzzword, but we're not going to prosper if we succumb to populism that says we don't need the facts. We need the facts. And Canadians have to understand that data makes a difference to the quality of their lives and hold the politicians accountable. Well, and this isn't just a thing for populism. I mean, we've seen governments of the left as well make decisions that were ideologically based and not based mm -hmm. in facts either. So it, but populism isn't right or left. It can, have, it can come from indeed, both directions. Indeed, that is indeed true. Uh, friends, that is our time. Uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us. Wayne Smith, good of you to join us, the former Steve, chief statistician for Canada in the nation's capital. And uh, around here uh, in our Toronto studios, Craig Alexander, Jan Kessel, Sunil Johal, and Tavia Grant, who made her television debut on TVO <laughs> tonight. <laughs> and you seem like it was okay. Survived. Still <laughs> sitting here. <laughs> Very good. Great to have you all on TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario.
Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.